We have been introducing you to most of the 17 truth commissioners the last few months. But four commissioners remain, and because next week will be our last program, we bring you four profiles tonight. Richard Lister was born to a Catholic family in Devon in 1953 and has lived in KwaZulu-Natal for most of his life. I was um, one of five brothers and sisters. My parents <coughs> um, are devout Catholics. My, my grandparents immigrated to this country from, from Ireland, came here as poor immigrants. And uh, I was brought up in a, in a large Catholic family. And uh, myself and my brothers and sisters all went to Catholic schools. And uh, I think that's where I can date my if I can call it my morality too, is, is that sort of Christian or Catholic liberal upbringing. After I left school, I went to university in Cape Town and I studied law there. And, and I think that is also a very, very important era for me for the development of, our, of my social consciousness. Because prior to that, I'd been to the army and I spent a year in the army and I didn't question my, my role. I thought that's what, that's what people did, that's what young white men did, and I went to the army with, without any moral question marks hanging over me. After the army I went to, to university, and I think there I, I fundamentally changed the way I look at, 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 at life, particularly life in this country. I'm married, um, my wife my wife's name is Elder. She works at the University of Natal, and we have two children. We have two children, Rosa and Liam, who are 13 and 11, um, and we're a very close family. We've tried to bring up our children in the same way that my parents brought up me and my brothers and sisters. They brought us up to essentially respect people's individual dignity and to treat everybody with equal respect and dignity, no matter who they were, you know, black or white or who, whoever. And, um, and I've, we've tried to bring up our children in exactly the same way. The most surprising and exciting moment in Richard Lester's life was when he heard the news that he'd been appointed to join the Truth Commission. For me, it, was, it came as a huge surprise even to be nominated because there was a, a long public selection and nomination process. You know, I think three or four hundred people were nominated by various organizations. I was nominated by the Human Rights Committee. Um, and it came as a great surprise that I should have been nominated. Um, and I never for a moment believed that I would have been appointed by the government. Um, but on that particular day, I can't remember when it was, it was early in December, the 6th of December, 1995, um, I was telephoned by someone in the Department of Justice and I was told that I had been appointed by the State President and it was, it was again, you know, it was one of those um, days which you can never, ever, ever forget. I've always believe, believed inherently in the goodness of people and I thought there's not much of that that we can see in this, in this work that we're doing. You know, I saw a lot of, a lot of evil that, that, that uh, that people did, that people committed. And I think it affected my, my, my world view of, of, of uh, what, what, what people are capable of. But then, you know, just as you, you sailing down that particular road, you'll come up against a group of victims who in the face of incredible difficulty, adversity, they maintain their humanity in a very powerful way and they, and they triumph over that adversity, and that that really enables you to 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 understand, you know, the just the strength and the courage that ordinary people have, and it restores your faith in in what humans are. For me personally, reconciliation is is it's an extension of how I was brought up. Recognize the humanity in in each other. That's what it is. It's, it's, we're human beings. We're not blacks. We're not whites. We are human beings. And reconciliation is, is recognizing each other's humanity. And, and that's what we have to do in this country. Mary Burton is a woman of many surprises. She was born in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Her mother is Argentinian and her father Uruguayan. She studied in Argentina, Brazil, Switzerland and England 
and started her professional career as a journalist with the Times of Brazil. Mary Burton speaks Spanish, Portuguese and French, but it was her English that she used to meet her South African husband on a skiing trip in Europe in 1961. I was very ignorant. I didn't know what I was coming to, but it was a very crucial time in South Africa's history and many people were emigrating and here was I arriving very innocent, knowing very little about South Africa. Mary Burton is widely known and loved for her work in the NGO Black Sash. She became a member of the organization shortly after arriving in South Africa in the 60s and became its president in the 80s. Good preparation maybe for becoming a truth commissioner in the 90s. I didn't think I would be very surprised by what I heard. Um, I think all of us on the Commission have, in fact I think the whole country has, has uh, learned much more about what happened. Um, prepared in other ways, I think the, uh, I was very reluctant to, to accept nomination for the Commission. I didn't want to do this work. I didn't think I was capable of doing this work because one of my characteristics of us on the Commission have, in fact I think the whole country has, has uh, learned much more about what happened. Um, prepared in other ways, I think the, uh, I was very reluctant to, to accept nomination for the Commission. I didn't want to do this work. I didn't think I was capable of doing this work because one of my characteristics is to be able to see both sides of a question. And I thought that that would be weakening, that one needed people with great tenacity to pursue issues and not to, to be affected by being able to consider all points of view. Now I believe that in fact if we're going to achieve reconciliation that it is essential that all South Africans are able to see each other's points of view. To me that would be what reconciliation would really be. If you could take a, say a young white man and a young black man and let them both understand what motivated the other to do what they did in those years. That would be a symbol of reconciliation. And I think also trying to make sense out of it at the end of the day. That was something that I tried consciously to do. Here we stood in these halls all over the country, uh, hearing these terrible things um, done on all sides of the political spectrum with often quite young policemen and women guarding the hall and trying to listen with their ears as well, trying to understand what was going on in everybody's heads. Um, it, and trying to say, this is terrible, but are we just going to leave it here? Are we going to hear all these terrible stories and then just walk away at the end of the day? We all worry about the imperfections and the compromises that we have to live with all, day, all the time. The compromises that create it, um, the questions that are asked, the criticism that is made of the Commission, but also just the short time that there is, the difficulty of doing the work really well, of paying proper attention to everybody. It's, it's very frustrating. One wants to take each case and somehow solve each person's problems and there just isn't time to do that. It is clear that Mary Burton is deeply affected by her work on the Commission. But how does her family deal with this deep commitment? I think in some ways it's, this is not so bad for my family as the year, some of the years in the Black Sash were. It wasn't very nice for boys at school to have their mothers standing out on the street <laughs> carrying a placard. Um, as they grew older, they, they accepted it much more and I have leaned on their support enormously. I know I'm very lucky. Um, when I come home from the Commission, I have a supportive husband who's been supportive all the way through in spite of all the things that happened in the Black Sash. Um, I have four sons who all live here in Cape Town who are, you know, we see often and they see each other often. Um, three of them are married and one of them has a child who is a great joy to us. And you can't really bring home all that stress to that kind of environment. It, you just leave it behind. My parents live in Brazil. Um, I was there this past Christmas with my grandchild to introduce him to his great-grandparents. Um, and they come here uh, as often as, as that's possible for them too. Um, especially in recent years over family weddings, so no, that's a very important part of my life, is that association with my parents. But for this great woman from Argentina, who became a fighter against injustice in her adopted country, 
One of the greatest moments was becoming a citizen of that country. I now realize that I, I wouldn't want to live anywhere else. Um, for many years, when I, when I went to visit my parents in the, in the very dark years here, I would sometimes sit in an airport on my way back and think, what am I going back to? A country that doesn't seem to be ever going to solve its problems. And I would say, well, if it wasn't for my husband and children, I would seriously think of whether I want to go back or not. And I never became a South African citizen in that, at that time because I felt that it was wrong to try to exercise a vote when other citizens, born citizens of the country, didn't have the vote. So I only became a South African in 1993. But I remember the feeling, the, the day almost, that I, I confirmed my feeling that I really felt I was a South African. I was flying back into Cape Town. And it was a beautiful flight. And the, it was a lovely golden light and beautiful evening. And as, I f as we flew into Cape Town, I had that almost physical sense of joy. I'm coming home. And that's when I knew I was really a South African. <laughs> Yasmin Suka attained her first degree in law from Wits in 1978. From here, her path went through various law firms and related organizations. A second degree in law followed in 1982. She's a devoutly religious person, and today she's the president of the South African chapter of the World Conference on Religion and Peace. My mother's actually from Cape Town, so I spent a number of years growing up in the Cape. In District 6, I have very fond memories of it. Um, I went to school in Cape Town, in Kimberley, and then finally went back home to my parents, um, I think, in Standard 3. I grew up for the rest of that time in Laneja. I spent two years at um, Durban Westville University, got kicked out of the hostel, and um, that's how I ended up at Wits in the, in the late um, 1979 period. I think I was one of four students who were admitted to Wits, four non-white students as they were then called, after a long period at Wits. Um, it's a very difficult period for me because I've not been used to mixing with students of um, other sort of color or background. And it was a growing up process in those two years. I didn't really find the practice of law um, so fulfilling. And I tended then to work more with um, religious organizations and with NGOs involved in human rights work. Yasmin Suka is a prominent and powerful member of the Truth Commission. She's deputy chairperson of the Human Rights Violations Committee. She has a reputation for being passionate and forthright. I was actually leaving for Germany on the day when um, the commissioners were announced, and Sheena Duncan actually phoned me to telephone me, to, to tell me. And um, phew, it was incredibly exciting, because for me, I think that you, you have law, you have the whole question of jurisprudence, but law doesn't often bring justice. And I think that what the Commission represented for me was the chance to bring morality and law together to achieve justice. And it, 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 for me, it was the most exciting time of my life, really. When people look at the work of the Commission, they should remember that um, within a two-year period, we've changed the discourse forever about human rights violations and nobody will deny that they took place. Initially when victims told their stories, people were disbelieving. Now that we hear the perpetrators, it's actually worse than people really thought. And, and I think that if the Commission has achieved anything, it has been that acknowledgement of victims and, and the fact that nobody can deny in South Africa that these kind of things happen, and that's a very important thing. After two years of Truth Commission, Yasmin Suka is showing the strains and stresses that this job, like no other, has had on those who do it. I tend to block it out. Um, I talk about it at the hearing. I go home, the normality of a family life, the fact that I still have to be a mother, um, a wife, helps me to, be, to deal with the fact that um, I'm not a superhuman being, I'm an ordinary person, but I don't sleep very well, um, so I read till the early hours of the morning, and I accept that that's one of the issues that I'll probably have to deal with at some stage. Um, they laugh at me in the commission because I complain about the fact that I lost a lot of hair 
uh, it, I think it's one of these sort of stress times. And um, I, I decided in December that I would start swimming. Um, and I go to the Ellis Park swimming pool, so I swim my 14 laps every day, and that helped me to relax quite a bit. But um, I'm compulsive about reading or looking at things related to the commission, and I get angry when um, I socialize when other people don't sort of share that interest, and I think I'm probably going to have withdrawal symptoms when the commission is over but I wouldn't have given it up for anything in the world. Sisi Kampepe is one of only two truth commissioners on the Amnesty Committee. She was born in Soweto and calls herself a child of the township. She studied law at the University of Zululand and practiced as a labor lawyer. My work at Fosatu and at the Industrial Aid Society exposed me to the adverse employment conditions to which many black workers were subjected. This experience was to cultivate my interest in labor law and charted the way forward for my profession as a labor lawyer. I would say it was really because of being exposed to those adversities to which the workers were subjected to that I became a labor lawyer. She attained a master's degree in law from the prestigious Harvard Law School in the United States. When she returned to South Africa, she opened her own law practice. Her extensive legal experience made her an excellent choice for the difficult and groundbreaking work on the Truth Commission's Amnesty Committee. Indeed, um, I must really confess that I didn't know what actually lay ahead of my appointment. I thought it was a formidable challenge that one would be faced with, and indeed that proved to be the case. But I, it also, you know, proved to be one of those historical moments that one should necessarily be involved with. I think the amnesty process is a fundamental process to the truth discovery. Without the process of amnesty, we would not have been able to come with all these revelations. I think many of the victims who have appeared before the amnesty committee have displayed a very noble notion of willingness to forgive because they have at least been acknowledged as victims and they have been acknowledged by the perpetrators. And that was, I think, a fundamental void, which, but for the TRC, would not have been filled, and which would have not enabled this country to chart its way forward. Sisi Kampepe is married and has two sons. Her amnesty work takes her all over the country and away from her family. I never anticipated the enormity of work that one would be involved with. I, I did expect formidable challenges, but not the amount of work that one would be subjected to. But I am fortunate in that my kids, in as much as they probably feel a little disadvantaged, they appreciate why that void cannot be filled by me. I'm also fortunate in having the kind of a husband I have who, as I have stated, has been extremely supportive uh, at both an intellectual and an emotional level. I think my husband has been my support system, not only now during the TRC process, but has always been there for me as a person, has always taken a keen interest in the development of my career. And I'm more than lucky to have a person who understands the importance of being part and parcel of this historic moment of our country.